I uh, would like to just give you some background on uh, both Mary Evelyn Tucker and John Grimm. They are both senior lecturers and research scholars at Yale University, where they have appointments in the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, the Divinity School, the Department of Religious Studies, and the Center for Bioethics. Um, and they teach in the joint MA program in Religion and Ecology and direct the Forum on Religion and Ecology at Yale. Um, Professor Tucker's specialization is Asian religions. Uh, Professor Grimm's is indigenous religions. And uh, their uh, efforts have um, led them to organize a series of 10 conferences on world religions and ecology at the Center for the Study of World Religions at Harvard from 1995 to 1998. And together, they are the series editors for the 10 volumes from the conferences that were distributed by Harvard University Press. After the conference series, uh, um, Professors Tucker and Grimm founded the Forum on Religion and Ecology at a culminating conference at the UN in 1998. They studied world religions with Thomas Berry uh, and worked closely with him for some 30 years, and they edited several of uh, Barry's books and uh, have been uh, very instrumental in bringing his work forward. And uh, they have uh, spent um, at least the last 10 years, I guess the conversations have gone back farther than that, on working on the film Journey of the Universe, which was shown last night and uh, we hope to show many times on campus over the, over the coming years. Um, and I, I want to say on a personal note that I've, I'm grateful that uh, they're here. I think you'll find them to be inspiring and uh, very instructional for us. And, and after they do the lecture, they will uh, welcome comments and questions from you. I will invite you to use the microphone over here on the right because we're recording it, which shouldn't intimidate you into not asking questions. Uh, but we hope you will stick around for conversation afterwards. Um, but it is really... Um, I feel as if I'm in, in, well, it's not as if I am introducing good friends. I feel uh, close to these two and feel very grateful for their presence here and hope you enjoy their presence as much as, as uh, others of us have already. And, and I'll turn the time over to them. Thank you so much, George. It is really a privilege uh, and a joy to be with you these last few days, see the beauty of the land, the beauty of this campus, to meet your colleagues, which maybe we'll even call Brother Rick and Brother Riley and uh, Brother Scott and maybe Brother Chip if he's here too, yes. Um, anyway, we've had wonderful conversations uh, with them and with the students. I just had a terrific class. Uh, of, that was remarkable. So I'm gonna take really good news back to Yale about B BYU, amazing students, wonderful faculty. And most of all, it's terrific to have John's family here. Uh, a brother of John lives uh, close by in Pleasant Grove and his daughter. So thank you for coming. What we're gonna talk about today, and we begin with mountains since we're in these great mountain ranges and this is the Bighorn Mountains of Montana. Um, we want to suggest that what we've been trying to work on really birth uh, a new field, an academic field, but also an engaged force in the society. In other words, religion has been studied theologically and ethically and so on, but is a force in, in churches and communities and so on all around the world. Um, and we're going to just begin by saying what influenced us to get into this work. Um, well, first of all, it's clear we are both historians of religion, as George said, but it, it's becoming more and more clear how cultural attitudes and behavior towards nature are influenced by a variety of things, including worldviews and values. But where do we get our worldviews? Well, largely through the world's religions, through humanitarian and secular values, through environmental ethics, biophilia, and aesthetics and the arts. So all of these are part of the conversation, but we're focusing on the world's religions in particular. Now, I got tremendously interested in this because of going to Japan in 73, 74. And you all young people have a chance in your tradition to go around the world, learn languages, and have that extraordinary challenge of getting outside your own cultural roots. 
And this changed my life, as I'm sure it's changed many of yours. But so here we have one of my first trips to a Shinto shrine down in Hiroshima. Um, and the, the traditions of Japan, the religious traditions, began to really intrigue me. Why is it there's such customs between people that are so completely different from ours? So Shinto is one of the basis of Japan, but so is Buddhism, Zen Buddhism. And I was very, very interested in the forms of meditation, in the temples, the gardens in Kyoto. And I was close enough where I taught in Okayama to go up there almost every weekend and be uh, infatuated with the art and spirituality of Zen Buddhism. And as well, um, I began to see, well, how does this society actually work? Um, and this is a large castle um, in Himeji. And the pre-modern era was very much dominated by Confucianism, which means literally hundreds and hundreds of years of influence from this great tradition from China. But it's very much the cultural DNA of Japan, how human relations are worked out, especially family values, which are so important in Mormonism. That's the Confucian glue that keeps society together. And we can talk more about that. But that became immensely interesting to me um, there's temples for Confucius, and this is true all across East Asia. So Confucianism has influenced not only Japan, but also Korea, Hong Kong, Singapore, and of course the huge mainland of China, and it still is influencing it today. So in terms of the numbers of people, Confucianism has probably influenced more people than any other tradition on the planet. And yet we in the West know very little about it because there's not a lot of translations of the scriptures and the history and so on. So that's something that I went into in my own graduate work. Um, and we're now going into why specifically I became interested in this religion and ecology. So the first was an interest in the religions. When I went to Japan in 73, 74, here was Mount Fuji. Um, here it is today. And the contrasts over the last 40 years, so since 1973 to 2013, the contrasts across Asia because of the modernization of China and Japan and Southeast Asia is vast. So here we have the beautiful rice fields of China. And here we have all over uh, this, the problem with nuclear, just as the Fukushima accident happened in Japan and so on, and is still leaking into the sea. So industrialization has brought problems, but, and pro promise, but also problems. Um, we have Guilin in southern uh, China. We have now immense, immense uh, problems with the water systems all through Asia, but the rivers in China don't reach the sea. The pollution is vast. The city of Harbin, as you know, just a few days ago was completely shut down because of pollution. Um, and this is, again, how China was when I first went, to, went there in the early 80s. Um, and here it is today. I was just in China in September, came back with a terrible cold, gave it to John. <laughs> um, but people are living with this all the time. And it is um, really scary. There's 66,000 protests a year in China alone on environmental issues. It's immense. It's something we have to think about as a planetary community. And it's why I was keenly interested in what are the values of traditions that are different from ours. So how can Confucianism and Buddhism and Taoism um, serve as an environmental ethics in Asia? Uh, so all we, now we go to John. I'll let you do the, uh, okay. the photos. I'm very pleased to be here also and join with Mary Ellen in thanks to our hosts. And I'm reminded by this particular slide of the uh, Crow family, the Cummins family. This is part of an extended family that adopted Mary Evelyn and myself. We are f uh, formerly adopted into the Birding Ground family. But it reminds me again how, uh, from uh, the standpoint of the Crow people, every story is embedded in every other story. So I uh, was born in North Dakota in the same high Missouri Plains country as the Crow people in Montana. And uh, that sense of, uh, of the hunting, the agricultural family that I came out of meshed very well with my work among Crow people. 
And so uh, I use this picture to remind myself not only of very dear family friends, but also of the sense of the landscape that forms us and these personal experiences that begin to open doors for us into local landscapes and into our relatedness to these landscapes. So as I uh, studied uh, indigenous traditions, especially this ceremonial, uh, which the Crow call Ashkise Lisua, Ashkise refers to the lodge that's being built here. This is a lodge which uh, has a central tree, 12 surrounding fork trees, rafter trees that, that connect the outer trees to the central tree, and then shade trees around the edge. And then you see the buffalo head, the subsistence, the major symbol on the central pole of the food that feeds the people. There's also an eagle in the rafters, which you can't see. But my studies brought me into an experience of a people who lived in relationship with the natural world, both by subsistence, even into the present, but their symbolic life endured from older patterns into the present. So this was my early entry into these issues of religion and ecology through religious symbolism. But as I began to uh, enter into these studies, questions about social justice and ecological ju justice, they began to fold into one another. So here you see Native people, Cree, Athabascan, and other peoples in the northern Canadian regions who are protesting environmentally damaging projects, in this regard, the uh, Tar Sands Project in Alberta. And so Native people began to develop a sense that their religious tradition, their life way, to use that term, huh? so a term that helps um, a situate religion not as something separate from daily life, but life way, a term in which the religious and spiritual values are threaded into the day-to-day -day life. And here we see this life way then brought to bear in resisting environmentally damaging projects. So along with local projects, you, you find Native people now beginning to communicate using an, uh, internet and other communications industries to begin to assert their position at the table of discussion regarding environmental issues. So especially the United Nations document here on the rights of indigenous people, commonly referred to as UNDRIP, we find uh, these uh, statements now by Native people are beginning to find a place at the table, international table, of environmental discussion. So uh, the initial studies that I had implemented from my graduate school days when I was doing my, th my PhD with this gentleman, Thomas Berry, he brought me to an understanding of the importance of cosmology and religious symbolism, and really Native people began to work with what Thomas Berry had given me and brought me into an understanding of their environmental uh, activism, their, uh, the force, as we were using the term in this presentation. So religious environmentalism. Thomas Berry had uh, some remarkable insights from his early studies as a cultural historian. And you can see the names of these work even suggest the, the innovative and creative way in which he was approaching these questions of the relationship of religions to environmental issues. Say, for example, the dream of the earth or evening thoughts. These last two works, uh, Sacred Universe and the uh, Christian Future and the Fate of Earth, bring us to some of uh, the efforts that we made in editing Thomas Berry's works to begin to focus his attention to the role of the religious traditions in uh, environmental concern. So Thomas Berry's thought has been a major influence on our project. In fact, he married us 35 years ago. Um, he came from, he was a priest and from the Catholic tradition, but had a huge library of 10,000 books where he studied the world's religions um, and has been a major, major influence in this field. One of the things he said often is that no previous human community has faced such a comprehensive crisis threatening ecosystems and species on a global scale. So he really saw decades ago what was facing us uh, into the future and really coming to bear now, the size and scale of the ecological crisis. Um, 
All of which is to say, we know that to go from 2 billion to 6 billion people in one century, the 20th century, uh, has changed everything. The need for resources, pollution problems, and obviously increased consumption. Uh, our society being one of the leaders in this, but now spreading it abroad to Japan and China and elsewhere. Um, is there another dream besides consumption? Are we just homo economicus? That's a part of the challenge of this work. Um, clearly, issues such as climate change, uh, if you have a chance to see Chasing Ice, it's an extraordinary film about what the filmmaker says are the dying of the glaciers in, um, in the Arctic, and we have been there, and it's very, very disturbing to see. Uh, other issues that are not so visible, but we are in the midst of a sixth extinction period, and the Museum of Natural History in New York has a plaque on the, fall, the floor saying, this is human caused just as the scientists are saying climate change is human caused. But we are literally losing species at such a rate um, that we're changing our geological era. This is the end of a 65 million year old geological era because of species that are going extinct. Um, very few universities are even dealing with this yet. And what this means for us, uh, even as humans, is very large to take in. So Thomas is challenge then is we have ethics in the world's religions for homicide and suicide and genocide, but not yet for ecocide or biocide. Although there is a lawyer, Polly Higgins, working on an effort on ecocide. And what are the rights of future generation here? What are the rights for your children and your grandchildren? Uh, these are big issues, and I can tell you from the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, the largest school for the environment in the U.S., 100 years plus old, we hear this news all the time, the sad, bad news of the destruction of our environment, and that's why we're doing this work. But we're also trying to create avenues for hope, for change, and the empowerment of the next generation. Um, and through the sense of our religious traditions, Thomas Berry would say the voice of the natural world is the resonance of the divine voice. And we've been having these wonderful discussions of how Joseph Smith had many similar insights and how theologians and scholars such as George Handley and others are bringing the Mormon tradition forward into this discussion. Um, one of Thomas Berry's most famous statements was the universe is not is a communion of subjects, not a collection of objects. So that means there's resonance, there's life, there's vitality. And again, the sense of a vitalism from a Bergson point of view, that this is a sacred universe, is what uh, Barry was trying to point toward. So from all of these sources, we began a series of conferences at Harvard. These uh, coherence, then, of our personal academic backgrounds, along with those teachers who formed us, uh, brought us to the question, what is it that we could contribute as historians of religion to this growing environmental problem? We happened to be at Harvard in the 90s, and uh, at this Center for the Study of World Religions, we met a director who was receptive to our proposal that we invite uh, scholars from the world's religions and selected scientists who would be musical to the religious tradition, and then perhaps uh, a few religious leaders. It's interesting that we uh, decided to focus on scholars rather re than religious leaders because we could see that the scholars were, were willing to reflect upon the tradition, whereas religious uh, leaders often had to position themselves in ways that didn't allow them the flexibility. So we, we really wanted to explore within these traditions, especially uh, a project that we uh, identified as retrieval, reevaluation and reconstruction. So our agenda was simply to uh, invite uh, a, a goodly number of scholars. So uh, we began with Confucianism and uh, Buddhism, uh, each separate conferences. And uh, by the time we finished, the, the numbers had reached over 800 scholars. And we produced a volume in each tradition. And basically, the agenda then was to reach into a tradition and to bring forward examples of where individuals or communities had interacted with local ecosystems and had recorded these interactions in their scriptures, 
in the commentarial tradition and that were evident in the rituals, say, for example, in the oral traditions that I study, who had no written scriptures but certainly had evidence in their storied traditions and rituals of interactions with local bioregions. So having brought to forward an example, uh, how to evaluate it? Does it speak to us today, or is it simply a historical example or even a revelatory example that's embedded in the religious character of a tradition, but it doesn't speak to us uh, in the current environmental scene? Uh, finally, if an uh, example does have uh, contemporary relevance, how does the tradition reconstruct itself? So one example that we see uh, in the Christian tradition is the verse in the Genesis, uh, first book of Genesis, uh, chapters 26 through 28, where the human is given dominion over the earth. And there's been uh, a number of scholars uh, over the last two or three decades who have begun to reevaluate re again. What does this term stewardship mean? Or how should we begin to understand it anew? And indeed, uh, the uh, Hugh Nibley, thank you. The example of Hugh Nibley is, uh, in, is very uh, illustrative in this example, in this regard, because his uh, efforts to re revisit stewardship in terms of the dominion issue were very rich uh, examples that he was able to provide. Yeah. So we just wanted to interject this fact that Hugh Nibley was a very well respected uh, scripture scholar of early uh, ancient traditions, but he was one of the very first to say that dominion should be understood not as uh, exploitation, but as stewardship. So the Mormon tradition has this in their past, and he influenced uh, Wendell Berry, one of the great nature writers uh, in the U.S. today. So it's an exciting thing for Mormonism. So this provides a, a general approach, uh, this sense of uh, uh, retrieval and reevaluation and reconstruction. Uh, as we went through these conferences at Harvard, gradually patterns began to emerge. And these patterns expressed themselves, say, for example, in the reverence that you find in traditions expressed in very different ways. One of the examples I find uh, very interesting is the attitude in many indigenous traditions of the hunter, who having received a dream call uh, from the animal that uh, he or she will hunt, uh, adopts an attitude of humility. They will never mention the animal they are going to hunt. So there's a number of features of this reverence that you find in tradition and how it expresses itself. And then the respect in traditions. This, I think, is a very interesting uh, relationship to a, a phrase that Thomas Berry used. He will say, uh, the call today to the human is to reinvent ourselves at the species level. And I think his use of the word species is very interesting dynamic in his understanding of the respect that we have for individual species and for ourselves in that regard, to reinvent ourselves out of respect that we have for the, hu the human in the community of life. Uh, so also restraint then in the use of natural resources very closely connected to the consumption issue. The social justice issue appears in the question of redistribution of technology, and aid. And then finally, also, uh, this morning I spoke with a conservation biology class, and it was very apparent the character of mutuality or reciprocity with all life. We're beginning to realize the, mm, that e ecology is not simply a major metaphor of the 20th century, but actually describes this deep reciprocity that we uh, have with all of life. It brings us into responsibility for the future of life, and finally, this uh, uh, extraordinary activity now that we find ourselves, we humans, called towards restoration and the humility that uh, it situates us in to understand the role that we have of restoring ecosystems in many settings. Along with the uh, Harvard conferences on specific traditions then, we undertook a number of culminating conferences. The initial one in 1998 at the United Nations led to the announcement of the Forum on Religion and Ecology itself, and we were uh, joined by uh, the Professor Du Wei Ming, a Confucian scholar at that gathering, and also at the American Museum of Natural History, 
Uh, we had uh, the help of Bill Moyers, who interviewed panels of representatives from the religious traditions. So the uh, Forum on Religion and Ecology has continued, and we've brought this now to Yale, and it's a very rich website that this uh, uh, project uh, uh, presents. Along with the uh, rich website, we have a series of books on the religious traditions, which continue to provide striking insights into the ways in which these traditions enter into environmental concerns. And along with that, a peer-reviewed journal called uh, Worldviews, which is very helpful in the academic field, because as we educate scholars entering into this area, for them to have a publication where they can uh, uh, continue their uh, academic uh, improvement and their academic performance. So the Worldviews Journal is very important. Uh, along with this then, the richness of the website. Um, and if any of you are interested in this, there's uh, little brochures on the Forum on Religion and Ecology website. Just basically, this, this took seven years to compile. There's a lot of material there, but we've annotated all the literature in English on the various world religions, so you can get a short description of books, of articles. Um, we've put in the sacred text, statements. The interesting thing is we're at a very important moment because all the world's religions and religious leaders have made official statements on the importance of this. Um, I should maybe qualify the efforts to have the Mormon tradition uh, do this. Last spring, uh, Marcus Nash made a very important statement at a conference up at the University of Utah at the law school on the Mormon tradition uh, that's moving forward, hopefully, uh, in this regard. But you can see statements of the various leaders. You can see engaged projects on the ground, what's actually happening, measuring uh, carbon footprint, energy shifts, and so on. We have a whole section on, on science and, what, and um, the science of climate change and ethics and related articles. Also statements by the religions on climate change. We have resources for educators. We have a monthly newsletter. If you want to have this come, it'll show you what's happening all over the world um, in this project of religion and ecology on the ground and in academia. Um, we also did a conference at Harvard on religion and animals. And this has been an explosively interesting field, um, in part because you know, we're animals too. Uh, but the, the sense of our relatedness to animals has mushroomed in the scientific literature, you know, starting with Jane Goodall and that relationship to chimps that she established and the research of many other uh, primatologists, Diane Fossey and, and so on with the gorillas. The sense of the intelligences in the natural world of various species, whale songs, the communication of echolocution of whales or of bats, how they move around, mig migrations of birds and so on. Why is it that when whales are beached, humans are responding now as never before? Why are people trying to protect turtles who nest on the coasts here and, and in Central America and so on? There's a whole new feeling for ourselves as a species among other species. Um, We've done uh, the first conference on world religions and climate change in 2001. This is available online. Um, we spent two years working on this, but there's been a number of other conferences on w why is religion um, important? Why are ethics important for climate change? Because people around the world, especially in coastal areas, are suffering immensely from the rising waters. I'm from New York, and you know, to see Sandy, uh, the hurricane, has left devastation all over the New York, New Jersey, Connecticut area. Um, so people are already suffering. The small island nations are suing the, the first world countries because they're losing their land. So these are ethical, moral issues. We have now more climate refugees than almost any other refugees. The problems in Africa are due to drought, climate change, um, et cetera. So, what is our response? What is our care for the community of life? Um, we have done also a series of short films, about 10 minutes each, on 
grassroots religious environmentalism across the country, fascinating uh, stories, and we had a huge conference at Yale bringing back these religious grassroots environmentalists um, to show what they are doing. Very heroic things, like trying to stop mountaintop removal in the Appalachian region. These are some of the oldest mountains in the world, as we just discussed in our class, and yet they're being blown apart for coal and the destruction of the water system there, of the environment, the toxicity, the health issues are unbelievable. Um, so people are saying, these are sacred mountains. What are we doing here? We have a whole series of books on ecology and justice. How do we bring the human justice issues to bear with the loss of the earth, of a sacred community of life? Um, we have been working for a long time in this dialogue with science and policy. And as you know, science and religion often exist uh, in, in tension. Hopefully some of it is creative tension, a lot of it. But we have really felt, and the scientists have responded enormously by saying we need the world's religions on board here. Um, you know, there's a billion Muslims. There's a billion point two Catholics, almost a two billion Christians. There's a billion uh, Hindus, a billion Confucians. The United Nations says these are the largest uh, NGO, non-governmental organizations on the face of the planet. Why wouldn't they be involved in the future of life, uh, both human and more than human? So scientists have been, not all, but a lot, have been very open to these processes, including Ed Wilson, uh, at Harvard, our dean, Peter Crane, Jane Lubchenco was the past head of, of NOAA, Tom Lovejoy and Ursula Goodenough. Um, these are world-class scientists, but many other scientists have been on board. Our, our uh, dean, past dean, Gus Beth at the University of Vermont Law School now, but he was at Yale for a good part of his career. He was also head of UN Development Program. He started NRDC, one of the great legal arms for the environment. The, the law has been continued by Nick Robinson. Richard Norgard is one of the leading economists um, of ecological economics. So what we're saying here is that religions are necessary partners, but they're not sufficient. We need the science, we need the policy, we need the economics, and we need this dialogue to take place in a way that the religious communities come on board with some humility, because they've been late on these issues, but they do have uh, something to offer. So, our new book. Along then with our own personal life experience, with those teachers who have formed us, and our work in establishing this conference series and the culminating conferences that came out of it, we have tried to bring this all together in a recent uh, uh, collected and joint effort called Ecology and Religion, which is forthcoming from Island Press in January uh, 2014. Uh, it's uh, interesting to us also that the editors at Island Press asked us to reverse the title of our project to uh, place ecology first so that we might be able to suggest to scientists, and this is a science-oriented press, that the religion has something to say in this particular issue. And uh, in this study then, we have attempted to uh, move uh, the academic field uh, of religion in uh, to the uh, closer connection with religious environmentalism or the force to begin to see how the academics relate to the grassroots movement. So as religions move into their ecological phase, we, um, we, have, so we see where leaders can play a significant role. Francis I has continued uh, statement, affirmative statements about the environment along with the past few Roman Catholic popes. The former uh, Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams, a strong environmental position along with the Buddhist Dalai Lama at the top. And then a figure uh, not as well known uh, at the uh, bottom, uh, my left, uh, the uh, ecumenical patriarch in the Greek Orthodox tradition named Bartholomew. And Mary Evelyn will have occasion at the end of this uh, the, the presentation to uh, probe a bit more into uh, the symposiums that Bartholomew has brought forward. But these religious leaders then are joined by uh, leaders in the re Asian religious tradition, such as Thich Nhat Hanh in Buddhism, 
and the uh, director and founder of Su the Suji form of Buddhism in Taiwan. Uh, she has been very active in disaster relief, uh, uh, managing to bring even recycled materials woven into cloth and uh, distributed in disaster moments. So connecting against social justice, eco-justice, and the Episcopalian Bishop uh, Catherine Jefferts Shorey, and in the evangelical tradition also, Joel Hunter has been very active in this regard. So we find, along with religious leaders, the sense that environmental justice moves from the grassroots up. So we have the opportunity now where we have leadership speaking and uh, grassroots leadership, such as the person pictured here at the top, Wangari Matai, who rose out of the grassroots of uh, Kenya and founded the Green Belt Movement, tree planting effort in Kenya, and then became a, a spokesman, a global spokesperson for issues of environmental justice, especially related to women. But now again, this sense that uh, uh, social justice and environmental justice as two separate activities is beginning to fade, and we see where the, not simply the overlap, but the real interrelationship of these two activities. Well, that's important to mention, yeah. Wangari Matai is a Nobel Peace Prize winner. Along with these uh, questions of religion, then we see the uh, bright and dark sides. The reason I wanted to mention Wangari Mathai, who was deeply influenced by Thomas Berry. She was a good friend. She came to our conferences in New York and elsewhere. But she was the first one to win the Nobel Peace Prize for environmental work, to say that we cannot have peace without peace with the earth. And so that connection um, and activating women all across Africa to plant trees to combat the desertification, the effects of climate change, and so on. Um, she was a remarkable person who just died two years ago. We want to emphasize, and I think it's clear to everyone in this audience, that religions have their problems and their promise. But we don't want to just seem too optimistic about religions. Um, so the sense of intolerance and dogmatism and exclusive claims to truth, which have been barriers to many people to take religion seriously. And this is very true in secular academia where we work, in, at Yale and Harvard and our years at Berkeley. Um, religion is kept, as you know, on the outskirts. Uh, but the, the top one is actually the destruction of a mosque in India by Hindu fundamentalists. And we flew into Delhi just um, a few weeks after this happened. And the whole country was in an uproar, killings. Uh, there was uh, police all over the hotels in Delhi with major um, arms and so on. So this kind of intolerance uh, we cannot uh, ignore. But as well, this otherworldly orientation. So are the religions, some of the religions, and I would say the Western ones even more, but inviting us to, you know, a paradise outside of these, this world? Or are they saying, oh, global warming, it's just fine. You know, we're going to uh, have Jesus return, the rapture, and so on. Um, or is it just about our personal salvation? If we're okay, if our families are okay, you know, we're not connecting the dots because our families are not going to be okay if we don't do something for future generations, for the environment. Water issues in the West are just one example. And water issues all over the world, if we think wars around oil are intense right now, think about water. Think about water. Um, so. Nature has been devalued in a number of the world's religions. This is Boniface cutting down sacred groves and so on. And we talked today in, in George's class about the anthropocentric focus. Is this all about us as humans? Or do we live and dwell in an earth community um, that includes the natural world? So the promise of religion is clearly, oops, that we have large numbers of people. I've mentioned the billions of people in some of these traditions. We have institutional authority, uh, certainly in the Mormon tradition. One statement from the elders would have immense impact uh, across America, I think, because the Mormon tradition has a lot of significance in this country um, and is, is, I think, well respected as well. If the Pope made a statement on the environment, a major letter, it will also have some effect. That's what we're hoping, and the grassroots as well. Um, 
the power of text and tradition. One of our students, Jason Brown, who was a student here at BYU and then came to Yale, and he's now up at University of British Columbia, has done a beautiful article, actually, on the Mormon tradition and ecology. Um, and it's published in the Dialogue, a Journal of, of Mormon Thought. So he's drawing on the text of Joseph Smith and others um, to illustrate what are the ecological roots within Mormonism. Education and moral persuasion are so powerful in these religious traditions. Environmental ethics in action, the top left slide is the Yale Divinity School with solar panels. Um, the evangelicals um, are moving forward on this, and that's a beautiful church in Alabama where nature is part of the worship. So what we're trying to do, though, is expand the definition of religion. And John will speak to this. It's uh, helpful to uh, understand that so much of the challenge that we face is revisiting terminology that we're already using and beginning to see it in innovative or new ways. So in this uh, new book on ecology and religion, two of the terms that we use extensively are religious ecology and religious cosmology. You can see that the addition of the word religious in front of each of these terms, we're trying to distinguish them from, say, scientific ecology and scientific cosmology, and yet we wanted to show that interrelationship. So the, the effort is to talk about the ways uh, religious ecology points towards the ways in which religions have transmitted insights into the interdependence within life forms. Uh, uh, within local regions and religious cosmologies, the stories that have been told within religious traditions of how the human fits into reality. So these uh, religious ecologies and religious cosmologies, I think, in uh, most instances, can't be separated. They can be distinguished. You can see how they interact with one another, the stories with the actual on-the-ground activities. But in many ways, uh, the traditions transmit them as one intact uh, activity. So uh, religious uh, cosmologies often focus on stories of how the human emerged from the universe, and they, they uh, give uh, the possibility for a re-examination of how religions see uh, the, uh, the sense of divine activity or the sacred embedded in the world rather than separate or transcendent. Similarly, religious ecologies then, speaking of how the humans are part of the earth community and that the divine act is imminent and points towards this interdependence within the community. One example, which is uh, uh, interesting in the Christian tradition from out of the Orthodox uh, tradition, this statement from Maximus the Confessor. Uh, interestingly, uh, Maximus uh, in the uh, third century uh, is one of the church fathers who uh, both, uh, there's many strains of Christianity draw on Maximus. So uh, in this uh, particular statement, Maximus is talking about deification and that all beings, all things are reconstituted and uh, achieve their permanence then. It's through this deification then that this permanence results. And it is for its sake and that uh, what is not is brought into being and given existence. So the, uh, the relationship between deification and the uh, existent order is celebrated in this tradition. Obviously, the Orthodox tradition uh, is very attentive to the incarnation dynamic within Christianity. And this uh, sense of deification then works itself out in the Orthodox theology, where there's a, uh, a attention to incarnation and a, a constant theological revisiting of this particular understanding that it's uh, possible for the, uh, the metanoia, the change, the transformation that these traditions bring by a uh, encounter with uh, uh, the created reality itself. This practice comes down to the present where we have the ecumenical patriarch beginning to reflect on ecological uh, degrading practices as a sin, as ecological sin. So the Orthodox tr tradition provides some interesting examples of how religious ecologies and religious cosmologies continue into the present. 
One other uh, example that I, I find interesting is our use of the word, uh, the phrase world religions. So it's no longer the apostrophe S as if religions belong to, or there's something about religions that all traditions aspire to, but rather rethinking this, that religions are embedded in the world. So we just want to make some concluding remarks here. Uh, but the Orthodox patriarch Bartholomew has had eight symposium on water issues, largely in Europe, um, but one in, the, in Greenland, in the Arctic, one in the Amazon, and one on the Mississippi. We've gone to five of these, which have involved very high-level people in the EU, the European Union, the United Nations, uh, people working on environmental issues, ministers of the environment um, in these various parts of the world. And for him to call what we are doing ecological sin or crimes against creation is absolutely arresting um, because he's trying to say, as John's just said, there's a holiness in the world. And we can talk about it as a W or an H, but that holiness is what is at risk. Um, so what we're trying to do then in summary is also expand this notion of the nature and function of religion to say religion orients us. That's the cosmology, the large-scale story. It grounds us in the ecology, in the systems of nature. That's how the seasonal cycles are part of our religious rituals. It nurtures us in these rituals, uh, whether it's food of, of Eucharist and so on. And it transforms us with ethical uh, balance and ethical energy. So this icon of Earth has probably one, been one of the most transformative images in our times, and it certainly was for us. But it's showing we are part of one Earth community. There's no future without a common future, is what this, this suggests. Um, but it's also placing us within galaxies, within the stars, within the cosmos um, as we know it. And some of you came yesterday to see this film, Journey of the Universe, and that's what we're trying to suggest. We are persons, we're part of families, communities, state, nation, earth, but also the cosmos itself. And this is an exciting moment for us to realize we're part of this journey of the universe. So there's a film and a book and an educational series of conversations, which we'll make sure you have here at your library. Um, and we're concluding with the sense that the tree of life, um, that sense of evolution unfolding, has been iconic in all the world's religions, the tree of life. And now it's a sense of expanding to include cosmos, earth, and human. And if we can bring this forward within our religious traditions or within a scientific discourse that respects uh, ethics and spirituality, I think we have a great hope for future generations. That is what we're working for. We're deeply inspired by our students at Yale. We were inspired today by the students here at BYU. And we wish you well, especially the faculty, uh, to make this transformation possible. Thank you, George. Thank you all for coming. So some questions, comments? Yeah, I think they want you to come to the mic. Can you do that? <laughs> so I think they're recording. So when you were talking about the losses in biodiversity, um, would you say there's been a gigantic increase in that in the latest years, or has there always been gains and losses as far as that is concerned? So we're at a, a radical shift in the loss of biodiversity, and especially because of becoming such a large presence on the planet, now mm -hmm. 7 billion people. And so the need for space resources development is, as we know, wiping out species of all kinds and mm -hmm. ecosystems. And that hasn't really happened too much in the past? Well, if you, if you have a billion people or half a billion people, no. So mm -hmm. this, because of our presence, um, especially since the end of the 20th century, beginning of the 21st century. In the last okay. 25 years, this has become more and more evident. Okay. You see? I have one more if that's okay. Sure. Um, I, this is, I guess this is more 
um, a study of behavior of people, but do you think it's even possible for people to make the decisions necessary to make such an impact? Because it seems to me, you know, we have the ideas of you can make those small decisions to help the environment, and if everyone does it, it makes a huge difference, which it does. But to me, it also may just seem like it's delaying the inevitable. So I guess the question is, is it possible for us to make a change in order to create these things we want to happen? Yes, the term extinction gives the impression of uh, something that is lost forever. And the, uh, that sense of loss, I think the religions are beginning to reflect in this area too. So I'm not sure if I'm going at your, your question. I have a thought in my mind and let's see if it uh, frames itself to match your question. That uh, uh, lamentation and uh, the uh, grief that is experienced at loss is uh, threaded in many of the traditions and uh, a striking a part of some of them. Uh, I'm wondering what the religious traditions will present when we be begin to reflect on the loss of biodiversity. What will it look, uh, I think not for myself, I, I will not see this in my lifetime, but uh, some of your children will attend services in which there will be a, a rather extraordinary attention to this biodiversity loss that you're talking about. The sense of loss of life. Some traditions uh, might speak of the natural world as scriptures or a revelatory of the divine. I believe that is uh, very close to a, f a fair expression of what's found in the Mormon tradition, mm -hmm. that the uh, handiwork of God is found in this world that we confront. So to, to lose or to talk about extinction from a scientific perspective, it's singularly important that we understand in a quantifiable way what that extinction means. But from a religious standpoint, uh, I think that there's an emotional impact if we begin to think about pages of the revelation that has been given to us uh, ripped out and lost and that revelation uh, lost forever. Uh, I sense that there, that's something unacceptable in the religious tradition, but that message has not been articulated clearly by leadership yet. Mm -hmm. I want to come back to your second question, which is can we make a difference, right? And I think absolutely. There's many things that people are already doing about their carbon footprint, their energy consumption, what food they're eating or growing, and so on. I mean, the local food and organic food is huge across this country. Um, so there's many, many things people can do, and it's, those are all over the website. Um, there are also structural changes that uh, we can try and make. And uh, you know, that includes politics, of course. But why we're trying to emphasize the religions is my experience as a person from the 60s who went to college in Washington, D.C., partly because I was deeply concerned about the civil rights issues in this country. I feel we grew up in an apartheid society, even though I'm from New York and interacted a lot with the African-American community. But we grew up with separate schools, parks, facilities. It's, it's almost inconceivable right now. And so I wanted to be involved in a movement for social change, which I felt was a moral issue. It wasn't until Martin Luther King said this, and other religious leaders said this is a moral issue of ethical concern, that we began to make the changes, you see. Yeah. So I do feel that when the religions come on board and say this is a moral issue because this is life, this is the sacredness of all life, you see, and that is where it's, it's incontrovertible. People can't argue with, we are destroying something that took 14 billion years to come into existence. The magnificence of these mountains, these trees, this season, this is a 4.6 billion year old planet. It took three billion years for the first, ce the first cell, about a billion years, but for multicellular life, it's extraordinary. You see, so we're trying to say the religions can make a difference, deep time can make a difference. And I think we're going through an hourglass of loss of species and an, an hourglass of lamentations, which we will have to have rituals about because I think there's deep anxieties in all of us and deep sadness. But if we can bring forward the creativity of the human in conjunction with the creativity of the earth, I think we can make a difference. 
we can create a flourishing community. It's never going to be the same, but we can do something for the future of life. Thank you. Comments, questions? Well, I think it's probably Friday afternoon, and I know you have a huge game tomorrow, but I really do want to say that this, you know, the question that was just asked, um, I think hope is the issue. I really think hope is the issue. And um, I'm sure John will have something to say to that, but uh, I've journaled for years and years about this because I feel that many people are at a point of disempowerment of hopelessness or helplessness. What can they do? You know, they can take care of their families, but what can they do for the future of life? And I think if we go into spiritual resources within ourselves, within our communities, and it can be outside the religious communities. There are many spiritually minded people in the environmental movement. And certainly the resources of, of nature literature of the nature poets. And I would suggest Terry Tempest Williams is a dear friend of mine, and I think her contributions and the contributions of other nature writers have been absolutely extraordinary. I recommend her book Refuge, which is about the loss of her mother um, and her other members of her family, the downwinders, due to uh, the government uh, testing here in the desert area but it's also the regeneration of the Great Salt Lake and what happens with the birds coming back. She's one of the great naturalists that we have um, in this country. So I think there's many, and she's drawing on her own tradition, but in a symbolic language that's, that's literary and powerful. Um, and my final plea, in, in a way, you know, is to women to have your voice and to find your voice that's very intuitive, um, that's very, I think, energized by a range of knowing that's often outside of academia. But I think we have hope in all of these possibilities within religion, outside religion, in the environmental movement, the voices of women, and so on. Um, those are some of my sources of hope. Uh, just as Mary Evelyn uh, sends out a, an encouraging word to young women, I feel uh, the changes that young men experience in their life too. The sense that Thomas Berry would speak of uh, the ecozoic period uh, as uh, the threshold uh, into our uh, new experiences of our human earth relations. And he said in that uh, ecozoic period, the human would develop a, a, return, a recovery of human earth relations and embed themselves within the earth community. And when that transition, as it was taking place, all roles would change. And so I think to myself, what is it that young men, what role is it that uh, that uh, period or this transition calls them into? Some uh, uh, striking observations that come to me are in this realm of hope, where it's not simply a matter of uh, optimism or pessimism, but rather a, a deep hope. And this term, uh, deep, uh, interests me. Uh, I, I think I'm waiting for a poet to reflect on it because uh, deep, I think, uh, has an immediate sense of mystery or what's unknown. It's too deep to know. But I uh, begin to think that this transitional time and what Thomas Berry was feeling was something is deep for us now because it's hard to achieve. It's something we have to win. And that's what I feel uh, young men are called to now, to win something about themselves with really the hard work of finding themselves in relationship to the place that they live in, the community that they live in, their a sense of their own body as a fourfoldness, a personal body, a social body, an ecological body, and a cosmological body. So it's that uh, hope that I feel, and I call out also to the uh, young men that we're waiting for these uh, examples of uh, your uh, hope for future.
Thank you very much.